Uh, my name's Adrian Jackson and I'm from EPCCC and I'm also a part of the, the Archer service and it's in the context of Archer that I'm giving this virtual tutorial. And what I'm talking about here really is, as it says, modern Fortran. It's not really modern anymore, uh, but we're talking about what the difference is between uh, Fortran 77 codes, which you may have seen in the past, uh, and actually still quite a lot of Fortran 77 or Fortran 77 based codes around now. And um, the updates that have happened since then to a Fortran standard, how you might want to move programs to that and, and some of the functionality you may get if you do that. Um, in reality, um, there is, there has been, as I'll, as I'll go on to talk about, there has been quite a lot of movement in the Fortran standard, new functionality, um, new thing, new features. Uh, but I'm not really going to cover large parts of that. Uh, in fact, uh, as part of the Archer training program, we do run a number of Fortran courses. So we run a, a sort of modern Fortran course, which is two days where we try and teach the basics of Fortran. But we also um, run a Fortran uh, 2003 course, which introduces people to some of the more modern features of Fortran, so the object-oriented stuff and the derived types and things like that, which I'll talk briefly about at the end of this presentation. So if you are more interested in that uh, newer functionality, uh, then um, one of those courses may be appropriate and, and uh, you can actually go online and have a look at um, the training material, the lecture notes, that kind of stuff, uh, if you are uh, keen to see if that kind of course would be of interest to you. Um, okay, so Fortran has a, a, a long and distinguished history. Uh, the area we're talking about here is from Fortran 77 and, and beyond. Uh, and 77 was a sort of big step change in Fortran where there was a strong push to really standardize the language uh, and standardize the features it provided. Um, but because of the limitations of the computers um, that were being used at that time, it was, it, there was a, 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 you know, the way it was designed, the way it was implemented, imposed limitations on programmers, which over the next 10, 15 years were seen as really restricting how you could write good and uh, a nice, well-written code. And so there was a major revision of Fortran uh, in Fortran 90 standard which uh, was designed to introduce a whole bunch of new functionality, but also improve programmability and, and the sort of software design, software uh, features of, of a language. Uh, but Fortran, uh, so, so most of what I will talk about is in that Fortran 90, possibly the 95 revision. But Fortran has moved on beyond there. So uh, Fortran 95 was, a, was a, a minor update with some new features and some and some little bits and pieces fixed in it and then at Fortran 2003 we have a, a much bigger um, revision with a whole bunch of new functionality added in there so object oriented uh, programming functionality and C Fortran to C interoperability both of which are quite interesting and can be useful in different circumstances uh, and then Fortran is, is still moving on beyond there so Fortran 2008 standard has, has co-arrays and some more uh, modular programming functionality and, and beyond. Um, what are the most obvious things that you will see going from a Fortran 77 to a Fortran 90 program, uh, 90 and beyond? Um, well, it's the change really from the fixed source format, which is specified for uh, generally use in, in 77 programs to the free form um, format, which is used in Fortran 90 programs. What does that mean? Well, that means uh, you, for instance, you can write um, variable and, and program and function names using up to 31 characters in length instead of six in Fortran 77. You don't have to worry about where you place your code in the editor, we don't have to the characters in particular columns in the editor because it's a free format so you can have your source code wherever you want and uh, technically the free uh, format has uh, supports lines up to 132 characters long 
although depending on the compiler you're using, that may be restricted to 72 or 80 characters long, and you may have to enable a particular compiler flag to, um, to let you have these larger lines. Um, and then, if there's, yes, so there's no specification about where in a line characters can be. Um, you, comments are now different. So in a Fortran 77 program, you'd have a, a character in the first column, usually a lowercase or uppercase C. Now in Fortran 90 and beyond, it's um, an exclamation mark for the comments. Um, and how you break your lines, so how you can continue a, a single line of code onto multiple lines is also different. So um, you break it in Fortran 90 using a uh, an and symbol at the end of a line. Uh, and if you um, actually want to break up t t uh, t uh, character strings, then you need to put an and symbol at the end of a line and at the beginning of the next line, as we can see in this my string equals hello and 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 welcome. Um, Fortran 90 uh, also lets you um, mix quotation marks as well. So you can now write you you are you're an idiot using the, the um, apostrophe in you are um, and uh, put that inside a character string. Um, let me just check. Okay, that's fine. And one of the uh, very important language features which formally came in with Fortran 90 um, is this implicit none statement. So Fortran 77 had um, implicit typing, as in it could work out if you didn't specify what kind of uh, type of variable was, whether it was an integer or a double precision number or a floating point or a character based on the name, in fact, the first letter in the name of the variable. Now, of course, this is quite useful if you're writing programs and you only have a small amount of memory to store your programs in and you don't want to waste text on writing out uh, integer or double or float or any of those kind of things. But in the kind of programming we do nowadays, it's dangerous because if you accidentally forget to declare a variable um, or you name your variable with a wrong starting letter, you may get an integer when you wanted a, a character or a, or a logical variable. So Fortran lets you turn it off inside your program. You can add this implicit none statement at the beginning of your source code, the beginning of your functions, um, and it will say, uh, you have to, it, it will tell the compiler to make sure that you have explicitly defined all your variables. In reality, so I, I, it officially came in in Fortran 90 standard. In reality, a lot of compilers were, had implemented this prior to the Fortran 90 standard anyway. So you may, find this in, in Fortran 77 codes, in old codes, because it was going around um, and was, you know, formalized in the Fortran 90 standard. But, you know, if it's, you know, if you, if I was to tell anybody just one thing about Fortran programming, I guess it would be always include the implicit none statement at the beginning, because it picks up so many errors that, that you accidentally make, compiler will pick up uh, if you add this line, and if you don't, then you can and, you know, get really nasty errors down the line. Fortran 90 also gives you a, a new way of defining variables. So it has this double colon uh, characters to let you, uh, rather than define a variable and specify its attributes, like it's a parameter, it's an array, these kind of things. You can do it all in a single line by having this separating the name of a variable on the right hand side from its definition, its attributes on the left hand side. As we see here, we have integer, that's the type of variable, comma, parameter, that's an attribute of a variable. It's saying this variable won't change. You know, it's like a static variable. Um, and then the double colon, and we can then put our name by variable. So integer parameter, Bob. Whereas prior to this Fortran 90 uh, feature, you would have had to do integer Bob and then parameter Bob equals six. So you can now uh, just mix defining variables a little bit more tidy. Now, there's nothing in Fortran 90 which forces you to use this 
this colon, double colon thing. So you can still declare things in the same way you would have done in, in 1477. You can mix and match. So you could just say integer Bob there, perfectly fine. You could also say integer double colon Bob, and that would declare an integer called Bob. Uh, and, and both of those would work fine. Um, okay. Um, another thing that you may have seen that uh, came in with a Fortran 90 standard is this idea of intent. So this is when you define a variable in a in a function or a subroutine, you can tell the compiler uh, any of the data which is any of the variables which has been passed in um, as a parameter to that function or subroutine. You can you can tell it whether the data is going to be copied in or copied out or copied in and out. Uh, and this will enable the compiler to say, well, you said that this variable you're passing in only gets copied in and doesn't get copied out, but you're changing it inside the subroutine. So I think you're doing something wrong there because you've told me you don't want to ever pass that value back out. I'll tell you something about that. And it also lets the compiler do a bit of optimization there as well, because for instance, if you pass in a very large array to a function or subroutine, but you're never going to change that array inside that function or subroutine, then you maybe don't want to copy all that data back out again because it's a waste of time because it hasn't changed. If you say, oh, this is an intent in variable, um, then it will um, only copy the data and it will copy it back out again. So again, there's nothing to say that you have to do this in Fortran, uh, but it's reasonably good programming practice because it both lets the compiler do a bit more checking for you um, of your functions or subroutines and that you're using the variables inside them in the way you said you would and it can also let it do some optimization there so it can let it improve the performance um, in some cases um, and then so those are sort of small changes to the fortran um, language um, changes in how you write the code um, and some little bits of functionality. But then there are some bigger pieces of changes which came in Fortran 90. Um, and one of them is this idea of modules. So a module is a way of taking a, a group of va variables and functions um, or procedures and putting them together inside a file and grouping them together as something that you can use in your program or use in other programs. So you can put them together uh, in a file and declare them as a module. Um, and then you can use this module elsewhere in your program. So it's a way of packaging up bits of code um, in a nice clean way, almost going down the line of sort of object oriented programming where you'd have a class and that class would have you know, data in it and functions that work on that data. So you could think of a module as something similar to a Fortran class. It's, it's not really the same, but it's a way of packaging up the data in, in, a, in a single unit and packing up functions that work on that data in a single unit and then using them elsewhere in the program. So what does this look like? Uh, uh, on the slide here, there's an example module sort so the module is a keyword it tells the compiler that actually here i'm going to define a module and then i've given it a name which is called sort but that name could have been anything okay just a name and then inside there i've got my implicit none to say actually you have to tell me what type of variables you're using fine and then i can define a bunch of variables inside that module and then there's another keyword contains and then below that, I can also define a bunch of functions, of subroutines, uh, and, and, and uh, functions inside there as well. And then at the end, I've got end module. So um, the variables that are declared above the contains line are in scope in the whole module. So any function, subroutine inside that module can use a variable that I've defined at the top of the module. Okay. Um, you can also use those, access those variables outside the module and access those, those functions or subroutines outside the module using what's called the use command. Um, so maybe I'll skip ahead 
to how you actually use a module um, and, and then go back and, and talk about the benefits um, or, 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 or some of the features of modules. So here is an example, I've got a program um, and then I've got in that program, the first line is a use statement. It says use triangle underscore operations. What does that mean? It says, tells the compiler, here, go and look for a module which you compiled, which is called triangle operations. So in a lot of ways, you can almost think of it there like, it's like include. It says, go and include this thing that you've defined somewhere else, okay? Um, it's different to, from include because it brings some extra protection for you, which I'll, I'll talk about. But we've got this use statement. Uh, the use statement, the module use statements go before any implicit none. Um, and then that means I could use any of the public data, public variables or the public functions or subroutines from that module triangle operations anywhere in that program. I could just call them. So. If we went back to this example here, I could say module, so I could say somewhere in another program, I could say use sort, and then somewhere below that use statement, I could call sort sub one, and that would let me run sort sub one, even though it's been defined as in this module elsewhere. Uh, inside a module, functions or subroutines are known as module procedures. Um, and they can be uh, public or private, actually. So you can hide them or you can let external users, uh, external users of the module use them. Module procedures can also contain internal procedures. Um, module objects or module data variables can be given the save attributes. So you can have save variables inside modules. Um, one of the nasty things about modules, but, but necessary, is that um, because they contain data and functions or subroutine procedures that you're going to use elsewhere in your program, you need to compile them before you compile anything that uses them. So if you've got, say, five source files in your program, um, one of them is a module, you know, is a module, it's got the module data and module functions in it, and another couple of those use that module, we need to compile that file which is contains the module definition before we compile the rest. And so that means you can't just compile your files in any particular order. You have to specify, right, I have to build the files which compile, contain the module stuff before I use them in other files, before I build the files that use them. And that can complicate your build process a bit. Of course, it means you can't have two modules that use each other because you then have a circular dependency on building those modules. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. You do sometimes see for large programs, people will write scripts or use tools. And there are tools out there which will do this. They're, they're just small sort of Perl scripts or Python scripts or what have you, which goes through your source code and works out which files are using which modules and where those modules are defined, and then we'll produce you a sort of a, a, a make depend file, which will tell you, okay, you have to build all these files in this order for, to get the module stuff to work. So we, I have seen that, I've seen various ways of doing that, but if you're writing or using large scale parallel, pro, uh, not parallel large scale Fortran programs and you encounter issues like this, um, then feel free to come and talk to us because we can probably help out with, you know, providing some of this functionality to curate your build process like that. Um, okay, so, so as I said before, uh, please do feel free to jump in if you have any questions at, at, uh, at any point with, uh, with anything I'm saying or, or uh, disagree, it's always good. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, so modules are a nice way of grouping together functions and bits of data that, that those functions or subroutines work on. That's fine. It's a nice sort of programming thing to do, nice software engineering thing to do. But in the Fortran context, what they also give you is the compiler will build explicit interfaces for these. So that means that it will do some type checking on arguments that are passed to 
functions or subroutines inside modules. Um, and that uh, can give you important compile time benefits. So you will say, well, actually, you tried to use this subroutine from this module, but you're passing in an integer and expect, it's expecting a, a logical variable. That's, that's wrong. And you don't get that with other ways you could write Fortran um, uh, external procedures where uh, they could be encapsulated in Fortran programs. They also give you the func functionality to save data as public and pri or private, and functions or subroutines are public or private. So you can write create a bunch of variables inside a module and a bunch of subroutines or functions inside a module, but you don't have to expose them all to the rest of the program. So you can make some of them private and some of them public. And so when you say use this module, you could only use the public stuff and you can keep some stuff hidden inside that as well. So it gives you a bit of encapsulation, uh, which is another key object-oriented programming feature as well. Um, Along the lines of object-oriented programming, uh, again, uh, Fortran 90 brings in the idea of derived types. Um, so this is grouping together um, data variables into types, which can then be reused later. So if you ever do any C programming, this is quite like a structure. Um, if you look at Fortran um, 70, uh, seven stuff and maybe um, so I should have said really in the module stuff so um, in some ways modules gives you some of the functionality that you see in Fortran 77 common blocks where they group common blocks to group to group together large you know numbers of variables um, and import them that way um, but uh, the modules just go further than that and give you more compile time um, compile time uh, protection. Also derived types gives you something like you see in a Fortran common block where you can group together um, data um, by names. Um, but anyway, so Fortran 90 gives you derived types, which lets you build more sophisticated types than you get by default from Fortran. So you can group together numbers of integers or an integer and a double or a character array and an integer or these kinds of things give it a name and then reuse that elsewhere in the in the program so the example we have at the bottom of this slide is we've created a person and that person has a name which is a, a character um, array of length 10 and also an integer which has got a name office number okay so we could then, once we have um, created this derived type, which is called person, we can then create variables based on that. So here we've got type, brackets, person, double colon, Fred, comma, me. So Fred and me are now variables of type person. And that means that they, they both have a character array and an integer inside them. And then I can access this, those components um, separately by using this uh, percent sign symbol at the bottom. So if I say Fred percent name, that lets me uh, access the character array inside that that uh, variable. And if I do Fred percent office number, I can access the integer inside there and I can read it and I can write it. You can also do uh, um, initialization of, of, of uh, of derived types um, as shown here. So we say Fred equals person brackets, Fred Jones, comma, 21. Um, and so this is like a, almost like a constructor for my derived type. So Fred is a variable, person is the type name, and then because person has two elements, a character array and an integer, I specify those two things um, when I'm initializing it. But we don't have to initialize like, like this. I could have said Fred do, uh, Fred percent name equals Fred Jones, Fred percent um, office number equals 21, and that would have done exactly the same thing for me. OK. Um, there's a minor detail here, but Fortran 90 and beyond, you get um, 
op uh, different operators, um, new comparison operators. So instead of having to say dot LT dot for less than, you can use the less than sign. And instead of having to do dot LE dot um, um, dot, you can do less than or equals. Okay, so I see there's a question on the, the slide. Is initialization also declaration or do I need to declare the variable first? So in, in my derived type example here, initialization is not declaration. So I've declared it on the, the line at the top, which says type person equals bread, uh, comma me. And then I've on a separate line done Fred equals person, uh, brackets, Fred Jones, comma 21. I could have combined those two into a single line where I said type brackets person, double colon Fred equals, um, and that would have done the uh, declaration and the initialization in the same place. Uh, but you, whatever you, you're doing, you when you declare the variable, you need to define its type. So I could have sort of made those um, one single line. So the, the uh, initialization could have gone on the same line as the declaration, um, but I haven't done that here. I hope that answers your question. Good. Um, and just a uh, just a reminder for Fortran programmers that um, this sort of less than uh, less than or equal, greater than, not equal stuff um, is fine for comparing integers um, and floating point numbers. But if you're using logical variables, you should still be using the dot eqv dot and dot and eqv dot. So that is uh, the top one is, is it logically, is this variable logically equivalent to this other variable? And is this variable logically not equivalent to this other variable? Because uh, logical variables in Fortran are not the same as you would do in C or other languages. You, Technically, you can't directly say, is this just equal to that? You need to use this EQV and NEQV um, notation. Um, as well as those um, new comparison operators, you do have the functionality, and I may be lying if I say this is 77, uh, 90 stuff. It may have been in, in Fortran 77. I have not actually checked. Uh, but it's certainly there from Fortran 19 and beyond. You do have the ability to define your own operators by using an interface, by defining an interface. And you can also overload existing operators. So I've got an example here where I say interface operator brackets plus. And then inside there I say module procedure um, real sum, in sum, and interface. So basically what I'm saying is if you use a plus um, for two variables, then go off and see if those two variables would match the variables uh, uh, arguments to real sum or arguments to int sum and choose one of those depending on which, uh, which uh, variables I'm passing, passing in. Okay, so I can override the plus operator here. Now, actually, that's not quite true because that bit of code I've given there isn't actually allowed because you can't override existing definitions. So Fortran already provides you a plus operator for integers and a plus operator for reals. So it wouldn't let me define my own. But if I created my own derived type, which, for instance, had two integers in each, in each variable, and I wanted to add those together, I could do this here. I could say interface operator plus module procedure, my type sum, uh, and then I would have to write a function somewhere which um, which which actually does the, the operation, adds two of my types together. But as long as I've written that and I refer to it here, I can write my own operators. So when, when I add two of my things together, um, it just goes and calls a great um, functionality. So I probably haven't de described that very well, but if you go back to this example here where we have a derived type of person, you can imagine you might want to add two people together. Um, and you say when, when you add them together, you, you concatenate the names 
and you add the, the office numbers together so that I would have to write a bit of code which said, okay, take the first element in, of the first uh, variable and concatenate the second element, the first element of the second variable, and then take the the integer from the first variable and add the integer from the second variable. And I could create a function that did that. And then I would define my operator here and tell it where to find that function and it would be fine. So again, we can see that some of the functionality which is coming in the Fortran 90, a uh, standard I think, um, gives you some of the things that you might want to do in, in object-oriented programming. So this is operator overloading. Um, we've already seen that derived types can give you um, sort of constructors um, and we have um, modules which let you group together things and encapsulate um, data. The other thing you, you may be able to see from this operator overloading thing is actually the interface functionality I'm using here lets you do this thing where you can say you can define an interface and give it a name and then inside that you can choose a number of different functions to call depending on what parameters are passed to that interface. So you can have one name for a function and then when you use that function, if you pass integers in or if you pass reals in or a combination of the two, it can go and call a different functional, a different function or a different subroutine at runtime when you do that. Um, and I've seen this used quite nicely, for instance, if you pass in a one dimensional array or a two dimensional array or a three dimensional array to a function, you may want to do different things. So you can create an interface, give it a name and then just define, okay, uh, I've got three different functions here. One processes one dimensional data, one processes two dimensional, and one processes three, and it will decide when I, when I, at runtime, depending on what variable I pass in, if it's a 1D variable, it'll use one function. If it's a three dimensional data structure, it'll use a different one. So you can have quite nice uh, ways of giving a single name to a function, but it be able to, um, actually call different things depending on what data is passed and that's done by the compiler looking at all these module procedures that I put in here looking at the types of arguments that they accept and then seeing what types of arguments you're trying to pass to it and matching them up based on that. Again if people are interested in this more um, sort of object oriented style programming, we can provide um, offline to this um, more examples which, which make a bit more sense. Um, I should have included in the slides really a bit more code examples demonstrating some of these things. But this is exactly the kind of stuff we teach on the four trans the three um, object oriented programming course. Um, but you don't have to go down the full object oriented programming to use some of these things in your Fortran uh, and still get some nice benefit from it. Um, some things, uh, other things uh, uh, useful in the Fortran 90 and beyond. Um, so do loops terminated by endo rather than by a, a, a line number. So in our second loop, I've got do 10, um, i equals one to 10, and then you've got your line 10, x equals x plus y, and that says this is where the loop finishes, that 10 there defines where the loop finishes. And most Fortran programs will use the, the top uh, format, which do i equals 1 to 10, uh, x equals something, n do. Now, technically, that only came in formally in Fortran 90, although just like the implicit none stuff, a lot of compilers has allowed you to do this do n do prior to that. So actually, you won't find that many Fortran 77 codes which are using the... Um, the uh, sort of uh, label way of doing it, which is this 10, 10 matching up the two tens. Okay. Um, more usefully, you get these cycle and exit keywords in uh, Fortran 90. So cycle, which says, okay, skip anything past this for this loop, but go on to the next loop of iteration. So in my code here, I say, do i equals one to 10. So do 10 loops of this iteration. And for every loop of this iteration, x equals x plus y. So add y on every time I go around this loop to x. 
but I've got this if i equals five cycle. So that basically just says on iteration five, don't do x equals x plus y, just go on to iteration six. Okay, so that can be useful inside loops. And exit can also be useful. So that just says if you call exit, you finish the loop altogether and just go on to the code past the loop. So it's not exit as in finish the program, but it just says exit to the end of the do loop and then continue. So this will go, go round and round this loop and it'll either finish when I've done 10 iterations or it'll finish when X has got a bigger than 100 and then it'll move on to the rest. Um, and also you get support for dynamic memory. So, so uh, allocatable memory comes in in Fortran 90. Um, so this lets you say, uh, I'm going to have a variable. It's going to be um, an array. Um, well, technically it doesn't have to be array. It could be a single variable, but, but making it allocatable then doesn't really make much sense. I'm going to have a variable. It's going to be an array, but I'm not going to tell you how big it is. Uh, when I compile the program, I'm going to define that at runtime. So you can imagine for many programs, this is useful. You don't know what, how big a data set you're going to read in until you start reading the file and you get, you know, this has got 10,000 lines. Okay, go and allocate an array, which has got 10,000 elements in it and I can store it in there. So we have this allocatable attribute for variables. Um, and here I've defined an array called Charles. I don't know why all my, my variables are men. I should really uh, address that. Uh, but I've got a, uh, an array called Charles and it's allocatable. So all I've said at compile time is how many dimensions it's got. This um, colon, comma, colon at the end of Charles says, I want an array. I want it to be two dimension, but I'm not telling you how big those dimensions are. And then later in the program, I can say, allocate Charles and make the first dimension a thousand elements and the second dimension 10 elements and it will go away and it will create an array that's that big for me. Um, of course allocation doesn't always work because if you try and ask for more memory than is available on the machine it will fail. So you can actually check that you can say uh, when you allocate Charles you can use this extra parameter stat so you'll see on my second allocation, I've said stat equals my error, and you can check. So that says when you do your allocation, return whether it succeeded or not, and put the return value into this variable my error, which I've defined as an integer. And then after the allocation, I can say if my error is not equal to one uh, to zero, then stop. So if my error, if the return value from the allocation is non-zero, it means it's failed, and I can do something appropriate in the program then. And also Fortran lets you check if a variable is allocated or not. So um, you may write a code in such a way that you call a function that allocates some data the first time it's called, um, but doesn't free it up. And then you don't want to reallocate that every time you call the function. So you can say, it has this variable been allocated. So there's, there's a function called allocated, which will say whether it's been whether this variable has been allocated or not so i can say if i've not allocated this then go and allocate the variable and if the variable allocation didn't work then stop the program um, you are responsible for memory management at some level so if you allocate a variable then an array you should deallocate it somewhere else but unlike c fortran is a little bit nicer to you in that Fortran automatically deallocates variables for you when they go out of scope. So if you allocate a variable inside a subroutine and, and that variable is only de declared in that subroutine, it's not a global variable, then when that subroutine finishes, Fortran will automatically deallocate it for you unless you've said that it's a saved variable and then it, then it won't. But that does give you some protection from memory leaks. It's not give you, doesn't give you um, carte blanche on memory, but it does give you some more protection than C gives you on memory leaks, which is which is quite nice. Um, although it's still good programming practice to put your deallocates in where appropriate. Um, uh, and then uh, another nice feature which comes in for Fortran 19 and beyond is uh, being able to 
spectral precision. So how accurately, and you, know, you know, the data range you can store in variables. Um, so in Fortran 77, you could, just, you could declare using a star notation how many bytes you wanted to use to store an integer or a real double precision number. So you could say, I want an integer and I want a four byte integer. Uh, and that will mean you can store a certain number of integers in there before it overflows and becomes negative and vice versa. Um, but that's, that's a very uh, controlled, and you can still do that in Fortran 90 programs and beyond. But, but there, the, um, the onus on making sure that, that is correct, that you've got enough space to store the data you want to store in the correct way is all on the programmer. What Fortran 90 provides you with is a set of functions to actually say, um, can, I want to store a variable with this level of precision to tell me how many bytes I would need to do that. So you can use this select int kind, select real kind, um, functions to say, um, you know, how how big a integer or how big a real you want to store. So here's an example. I've, I've got this select int kind nine, okay, the parameter. And then when I declare my variable i, I say integer brackets kind equals large int of i. And that means that the i variable will be able to store um, any number, any integer, which is between minus 10 to the 9 and plus 10 to the 9. And if I put um, 12 there instead of in the select int kind, I could store a larger integer. OK. Um, and if you go and say, I want, to, I want to store an integer here, which is too big. The system cannot, doesn't have enough memory space to store that, doesn't have enough bits um, to store that, then um, Fortran will, will tell you that. So when I do my select int kind, it won't return a number which is positive, it will return a negative number. And I should check that and say, okay, actually I've tried to do something this system doesn't support. Uh, that's a, a problem for my program. Um, so you get exactly the same kind of thing for real numbers, but here, um, as well as specifying the exponent range, we also specify the number of decimal digits uh, we want to store the precision of a decimal digit. So here we've got a select real kind. I want to be able to store up to six decimal places and plus or minus 10 to the 37 uh, in the exponent. So this lets us define our own precision somewhere in the program, maybe in a module, and then use that everywhere we define a real or an integer variable um, and then if we want to change our precision at some point, okay, we've been running in double precision, now we want to see if we can run in single precision. Uh, does that affect our results? We can just have to change this parameter, like I've got here, small real, change it in one place. That can change all our, all our uh, reels everywhere in the program or all our integers everywhere in the program. And we can see what, what impact that has on our, our program. So it both gives you the, the, an easy way to sort of change precision in the program cleanly, uh, but also um, query the system you're running on and say, is this kind of precision supported? Do you have the number of bits in your um, arithmetic, in your floating point units or in your integer units to support what I'm asking you to do? So we are quickly running out of time, so I will um, speed up slightly, but um, we have array operations coming in Fortran 90 as well. So it's one of the things that Fortran 90 is more commonly known for, array operations. Um, so instead of having to um, have a loop through all the elements of an array to do an operation, you can just do A equals zero. If A is an array, 1D array, 2D array, 3D array, doesn't matter. It will set all the elements of A to zero. Okay, and I can say A equals B plus C or B equals C plus D. And if all those arrays are the same shape and size, then that will work, okay? We can also work on subsections of arrays. So we can say, um, using these um, notations, you know, the whole array is uh, just a single colon, or we can say starting from this element and going up to the end, 
or um, start at the beginning and going up to an element. There's, there's various things we can do in there. Um, one thing to um, bear in mind is that some of these, like the elements 1 to 15 in steps of 2, so this is colon, colon, 2, if you call that, it may end up copying data into a new array, and you work on that new array, and then it copies it back. So some of these array subsections that you can work on can have performance impacts in your program, so they're worth thinking about before you, you do them. Um, if you really need them, that's fine, but it may be it's just a, you know, you've just simplified something, but actually you've ended up copying a lot of data around to create these array subsections um, when you could have just had a, a, a simple loop which did the same thing without the data copies. Um, and we have this where statement um, where we can say, actually, I want to do everything on this array, but only do it where the value of the element is, is a certain kind. So here, for example, where any element of P, which is an array, any element of P is bigger than zero, set that element to be the log of itself. Okay, so I can say, uh, where any element of P is bigger than zero, um, set element, uh, the same element in X to be equal to the same element in X plus the log of P and the same element of Y to the same element of Y minus one of P. Again, there, P and X and Y need to be the same size and shape. And we have other functions. We can do count, sum, mod, all these kind of things across arrays, as well as just doing basic, basic arithmetic uh, and mathematics on the arrays. It's very, makes it easy to write very concise programs. Now, of course, you could do all these things yourself without doing array notation. You could do it with loops. You could write it out longhand, so you iterate through all the elements. Uh, and would should give, it will, will give exactly the same result. Um, but the array notation should give you an optimal way of doing it um, and um, sort of negate some of the issues, performance issues people do come across with things like going through arrays in the wrong order uh, for performance reasons, you know, going through arrays in a non-contiguous memory order and these kind of things. So, they, and, it, and it makes a program reasonably easy to understand and read, so they can be quite nice features to use. Okay, so we're coming to the end now. Um, those are some of, not all of, but some of the features in, in Fortran uh, 1995. Um, if you've got a Fortran 77 program, it's generally really useful to be able to move it to Fortran 90. You get better readability, better maintainability, uh, possibly a better choice of compilers, maybe not. Uh, what are you going to have to do if you want to move between Fortran uh, 77 and Fortran 90? Well, you know, some of it is pretty, you know, uh, standard, um, just uh, coding work, unfortunately. So it's things like you need to change the comments um, from a C to an exclamation mark, and you need to change your continuation lines. So you want uh, uh, an and sign at the end of a line rather than in the beginning at, in column six. You've, of course, now got much more freedom to restructure your code so you don't have to line up to various uh, columns in the in the in the source file. Um, if you're not already using implicit none, then you should be putting in there. Make sure it's um, uh, it is uh, there so that you are explicitly declaring all your variables. You can also rename um, variables now because you don't have to have character variable names or or function names or subroutine names to only six characters long. You can expand those to be much more descriptive, which is also useful in understanding people's programs. And if you're going through that process, it's also useful to put in these kind parameters so you can specify at one place in the file in your program what the precision is and then use that everywhere else. Okay, so you can control yourself. More um, more work, but uh, again, very useful is thinking about restructuring your program into modules. So taking external procedures and then putting them into a module file, moving common blocks into modules as well, will give you um, much more safety when you're compiling your programs, but you do have to be aware of, okay, well, if I move this into a module, then I have to use a use statement in any function or subroutine which calls things from this module, and I need to compile them in the, in the correct order. But if you 
go through that process at the end you'll get a much better uh, structure of code much more maintainable code hopefully um, you should use modules if you can and by default what you probably want to do is make everything in the module private so you can see at the top of the module by default everything's private you just put private keyword in and then you can manually choose which things you want to be public by saying public this, public wrap, public the other. And that can be useful um, because that lets you have, you know, variables of similar of the same name in different modules, but you're not getting confused in the program what's going wrong. As long as they're private inside each module, it's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, consider array syntax. And um, one that can be very useful is moving from uh, static allocation to, to, to dynamic allocation. And I've seen codes, Fortran 77 codes in the past, which have also used malloc from C, C library. Or, or there is a, actually GNU intrinsic malloc to do dynamic memory allocation using C mallocs and freeze uh, from Fortran. If you have that in that code, it's probably much safer to move to a, a Fortran. Um, allocate and deallocate because it gives you this automatic allocation and de sorry, automatic deallocation of of um uh, of arrays once they go out of scope it may be there are times when you have to write a library code or a bit of code where it needs to work with both fortran 77 and fortran 90 programs i've seen that before it is possible to do um there are some things that trip it up you're not allowed inline comments, okay? Um, you can use the semicolon as the comment character, but make sure you put it in the in the first column. Um, now, it's not strict, you know, strictly speaking, if it's a Fortran 77 compliant program, it should be a C for a comment character, but, but most compilers don't care. As long as the character in the first column, they'll take that line as a comment. Um, and the one, and if you have to break lines, to split the code across multiple lines, then you need to have this ampersand, this, this and sign, both at the end of a line, but after the 72nd character to make sure that the Fortran 90 compiler understands you're breaking the line, and also at the beginning of a line for the Fortran 77 compiler. Now, most people won't need to do this, but I have run across occasions where you have to write a bit of code, which is called by a couple of different applications, some are Fortran 77, some are Fortran 90. For instance, uh, writing an I.O. library, I've seen this before, and you can get around the, the issues and write code which, which will be co compatible by both compilers. Okay, so very, very quickly, um, just to round it off, the, the newer features beyond Fortran 1995, so the 2003 and beyond, which may be interesting to you, uh, uh, so there's new functionality to interoperate between C and Fortran so that the data types are compatible. Uh, you don't have to do this manually by hand anymore. You can use this new, a new module called ISO C binding and that can be very useful if you want to call C libraries or C functions from your Fortran code, that's very useful. Again, we, we teach that on the 2003 course, but if anybody's interested in that, we have more material. We can talk about that. We can do. We can help you out with that. And then some of the stuff we've seen in Fortran 1995 has given us semi-object-oriented programming in Fortran. Um, so encapsulation in modules, controlled access to data with private and public keywords, polymorphism and operator overloading with interfaces. Um, Fortran 2003 introduces new stuff. So you can do proper classes in Fortran 2003 where you bind types um, to data. Um, so, you bind, so you bind functions to types so that the data has the functionality which uses it bound directly to it. Uh, and you can have class variables. Uh, and that can let you write some really interesting code uh, for Fortran. Um, and as I say, we do teach a couple of day course on this uh, for F Fortran 2003 and all the, all the materials for that online. So if you're interested in object oriented programming in Fortran, then, then go and take a look or, or contact me and, and we can discuss it. And then there are more uh, newer things than that as well. So parallel programming support and co-arrays, 
recursive procedure support. Uh, some of this may not be in all the compilers yet, because it's maybe Fortran 2008 or, or beyond as well. So um, I'm out of time, and that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, but I am around, I'm not running away. Um, so if anybody has any um, questions, comments, anything like that, then feel free to ask. Um, we will, so this, this, this webinar has been recorded, it will be put up online. Um, we can, uh, you, you, you'll be able to go and find it and, and play it back uh, and see the slides at a later date, um, as with all our virtual tutorials and our training material, it's all up on the Archer website. But yeah, um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And if not, uh, thanks for, okay, so thanks for uh, attending. Let me see the chat window again, the chat window. Okay, so, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, I have one question, do uh, using allocatable arrays change performance? Um, not, not in my experience. No, um, if you do, so it's a slight lie. If you do it sensibly, it shouldn't change performance at all. If you were to allocate and deallocate arrays in tight loops for some reason, which I have seen done before, um, then, then yes, that would change performance. Um, but if you do your allocation and deallocation at a higher level in the program, then there should be absolutely no difference between that and um, standard uh, static data. But if anybody has any experience otherwise, we'd be interested in in discussing that as well. I hope that answers your question, Edward. Edrin, I think Hank wants yeah. to ask something as well. He's raised his hand. Oh, well, uh, Hank, if you want to speak or type in the thing, please do. And whilst you're doing one of the two, um, Becky asked, Becky asked, um, you said a bit about linking with C, if a link is a ways to link with other languages, e.g. Python. That's a good question. Um, I've not looked into this. So theoretically, you could link both C and, and link um, Python to C and Fortran to C, and you could link through that. Whether there is a Fortran to Python binding thing, I don't know. Um, if you want to drop me an email, my email's on the slides, but I can, I'll can i put it in this chat as well. Um, I'll have a look later um, and I will um, see, contact you, um, contact you if I find anything. But it's not something I've, I've come across as such. But then I'm not a massive Python programmer. So maybe others, others know other things. Um, oh, for Fiona, for um, okay. Oh yes. Uh, so Fiona says, but if you allocate, so Edward's question: if you are, is there a head of allocating um, or deallocating? Uh, Fiona says, that in her experience, allocating arrays inside thread blocks of code may give you performance issues if using lots of threads. And that is true. So when we start doing parallelism, there could be um, there could be issues with the allocatable, but as long as you're not doing allocations inside threads or inside tight loops, you should be good. Um, okay. Hank says, can copy and array sections be avoided by assigning to a pointer? Copy and array sections, yes. Yes, I think it can, but it may be slightly complicated. Um, pointers in Fortran are complicated anyway. You may be better, it depends on how you're copying these things through, but you may be better passing the whole array in and then doing your, your doing your sort of uh, array, if you're passing it into a function or subroutine, and then doing your iteration over sections inside that rather than trying to 
copy it through. But I, I think possibly you can define um, a pointer to a structure which will iterate through this without copying it. Um, okay, so there's been lots of talk about for Python to Fortran. Uh, I'm glad other people know about this. Python to Fortran. And whilst you're chatting away, um, which is perfectly, which is great, um, someone's asked me. Um, I'm working with old Fortran codes which use common blocks. I'm thinking of updating to modules. Will there be performance issues? No, absolutely not. It should, it should be uh, exactly the same performance uh, and a very sensible thing to do. So I can ask actually um, uh, here at EPCC um, about A Python to Fortran because we have people here do Python in a lot more anger than I do or certainly um, in a lot more earnest than I do. So I, I'll ask if anybody knows from going Python to Fortran. So I assume what you mean there, Becky, is can you call a, fo a Fortran function from Python? Um, and yes, I think I'm sure you can do it, but exactly the best way of doing it, I don't know. Um, so um if you drop me an email uh, i'll ask around and i can always email back or if anybody wants to drop me an email it's perfectly fine uh, and i can try and find out the answer to this and get it back to anybody who's interested no worries any other questions And so, no, uh, Andrea, I don't, uh, in terms of uh, common blocks, modules and, and common blocks should give you no performance differences. Absolutely none. Thanks, everybody.